Okay, so uh, distance. You may wonder what I, I mean by that. So, um, you know, people typically start with acceptance criteria. And I find it necessary to, to not only come up with examples that illustrate that, but come up with the essential examples that do a good job of, of illustrating it. If we start with thinking about what our desired outcomes are, we want common understanding of, of what we're trying to do, what we're trying to achieve. And what examples will help us achieve that? What examples will make that clear? We want automatic verification, but, um, but not just passing tests. We want, want to verify that we're actually actually and durable documentation. And to make that documentation durable, if you read it a year, five years from now, it needs to communicate the intent. So, so that's, that's very important. I, I've too often found people who, um, you know, six months later, uh, a test is failing and nobody's sure what that test was supposed to be testing. So they just delete it because they're not, not sure how to recover that intent. One of the ways that people often talk about doing this is the declarative versus imperative, talking about what you're trying to do rather than how. And this is a good beginning, but there are also a uh, matter of what details you put in. Uh, Dale Emery says that he didn't originate this, but he got it from someone else, but I learned it from Dale to express all the details that matter and none that don't matter. And so how does that work out? Well, if you look at a uh, scenario like this, which of these details matter? It's really hard to tell, isn't it? Does this communicate the intent of what you're doing? There's a whole lot of stuff about logging in and searching and adding to cart. And then we're just checking that the subtotal is zero. Well, what does that mean? You can go too far the other direction too. So you look at this and, and well, I look at this and questions pop into my mind. Who qualifies? What is appropriate? What's an appropriate book? And what's the discount? So we want to go for something that's in between. So here we're talking about an avid reader. Well, we may not know what an avid reader is just from this scenario, but at least we know that's something, that's, that's the class of user that qualifies here. And we know how they, you know, what's appropriate. So they're in a situation where they've already bought three books that cost more than $3.95. And then they add a book not price not $3.95 to the card. That tells us what's appropriate to get the discount. And we see that they got a discount of $3.95. And so that last book is free. So that's that's the just right of the three little bears. So let's look at a different example here. So we want to get the, the appropriate details, the details that matter. So that means we want to go to the essence of what we're trying to do. What is our intent? What really describes it? Here's a typical starting point that you might see. Um, is this the essence of, of a timer? Or if somebody handed you this timer and asked you to test it, this might be what you started with. But, you know, that's that test after approach where here we've got, got this thing and we want to test it rather than starting out with what are we really trying to accomplish here? Because pressing 300 is not really important to what we're trying to accomplish. What if we uh, had a different timer? What if, you know, there is no 300 on this one that, that's uh, in Chinese. There's no 300 on this one that, where there's a minute and a second button. So we might express our intent a little differently. 
we want to enter three minutes and press the start button. And we don't care how we enter three minutes. And we don't care how the start button is labeled. So is this better? Is this the essence of a kitchen timer? Well, there are other types of timers too. These don't have any start button. So what do we do there? These don't buzz. So we want to, um, we can generalize this more and come up with a scenario that works for all of these different timers. So we can develop a scenario today for what we're building. And as we modify it in the future to add new features, then we're still we can still check that it meets the intent of what we're doing today. So here's some rules. If it's essential, then it doesn't change when we change the user interface. If it's essential, then it doesn't change when we change the, the user workflow. The, uh, the precise actions of the user are not part of the essence of the timer. The construction is not part of the essence of a timer. There are lots of different kitchen timers and you can do it, do it in different ways. But the important thing that we just did here is we started with something rather naive based on one idea of what a kitchen timer was and then we improved it. So we made it, uh, um, we, we took it from being sort of a surface level description of a particular timer to something that described more of the essence of any kitchen timer. And that's a useful technique. It's hard to, to jump right to the best expression. So we can try this again. What about this scenario? What's it testing? Can you guess at that? It's sort of lost in the details, isn't it? You can't see the forest for the trees. Look at all these different details. They probably don't matter for travel reimbursement. Does it re really matter whether or not, whether you ate an egg sandwich or maybe had uh, pancakes? Probably not. So we can get rid of a lot of these details. And when we do that, the detail that we don't get rid of stands out. Oh, that one looks more significant. For some reason, that one is significant because we're mentioning it when we're not mentioning the others. So that makes, makes that aspect more obvious. So can we do better than that? What if instead of saying a glass of wine, we mentioned that it's about alcohol? Now, those of you in Europe may wonder why would that make a difference but in the united states <laughs> then uh, then uh, the companies have found that they can uh, can deny alcohol and that saves them money and nobody can complain about it because of the uh, puritan beginnings of this country <laughs> so this gets more to the heart of the matter and wait a minute if you add this up and subtract the 650, do you get $43? There's something missing here, right? So we need some more details. Oh. So this tells us what, what the rules, you know, what the limits are so that we can calculate and see if $43 is really right. But does it come up with $43? Maybe we're still missing something. It's a small thing, but it makes a difference. The computer can't do the thinking for us. We have to do it. So we look at this. This scenario now is, lets us understand where the $43 comes from. It expresses what these different limits are. And, and checks things. It expresses that alcohol is not reimbursable or the tax on the alcohol. But it's doing a lot of different things all at once. And so 
it's a little confusing to, to tell exactly what's what. So we can split this out into different scenarios. Let's take breakfast, lunch, and dinner separately. And we can see this and, and it's clearer to us. And then we can name them better. And that lets us understand just by reading the name what the purpose is of each of these scenarios. Now, as we look at those in more detail, we might notice that, hey, we're, we might be missing some scenarios. What else would be important here? We've made it clear enough that we can notice that we're not really checking the reimbursement limit for lunch. So we can add that in. Another thing we might want to do is document what the rules are. Uh, it's, it's great to have examples, but examples don't replace the rules. If you've only got examples, then you're trying to reverse engineer what the rules are. Now, uh, testers who are handed something and told to test it after it's built are often in that situation where they're trying to figure out what are the rules that are actually in force and do they make sense? But it'd be nice to also know what rules were intended when we started this project. So we can also break out the, the common conditions. When we were back here, we had the conditions in each individual scenario. But we can break them out so we only have to read those once. We know that they're true for all of them. Because if we're putting them in each one, then each scenario we have to look, oh, is this the same as what we had before? Does it matter? We have to play a game of spot the differences. And that can make, that can hide things that are significant that we don't, and we don't notice them. So we want to let the essence of each scenario shine through. Once we've broken out those common conditions, then, then we can send, we can, um, we can look at the scenarios and focus just on what's important. And I say I've got a typo here in the third scenario title. So that stands out to me now, whereas it didn't before. <laughs> now, we look at this, these are perfectly good. And this may be good enough. Um, sometimes we don't feel like we need to, to be complete about everything. Do we need to check that, that if we're under the reimbursement limit for breakfast that it's okay? Maybe not. But maybe you decide that you do want to be more complete, in which case you might want to go to a table format. So this lets us check exactly where the limits are and check it in, in the different conditions. Um, you, you, this can get, you know, if you're trying to check a lot of permutations, this can get be unreasonable. So you don't always want to do that. But notice that none of these mention alcohol. When you've got a, a different con construction for your scenario, something else that matters, split that out. Don't make it that alcohol cost is zero for some. You know, don't have parameters that you're not using in that scenario. Make it, make it explicit so we can see it. So let's, let's review what we did. So well, first we removed incidental details. And we abstracted those details where possible. But be careful about this. Don't get them too abstract. Um, it's, it's easy to go too far. Sometimes it's, it's better to put, leave something over detailed than a little under detailed. But then we want to put in the relevant details explicitly. We want to make it so that when somebody new comes along and reads this, they'll understand what this means and what it's trying to say. We separated the uh, different rules into different scenarios. 
this helps make, make the uh, clear what each of these rules is doing. There may be, you may want a scenario that handles more than one rule also, just to make sure that they work together well. But in some cases, you don't need that at all. We named the scenarios so that they said that what they were doing. We looked for missing scenarios. And it's easier to do that when we get rid of some of the extraneous detail, make them clearer. We documented the rules and we shared the common conditions with our background. And finally, we clarified more conditions. So we, we handled more scenarios to show the differences between them. And then we can celebrate. Ooh. So this is a sort of a quick run through, but what did we, what did we learn there? What are your conclusions? So maybe you can type, type what you learned into the chat and uh, Theo can read them out. And feel free to use the Q&A as well. If you've got a question, we can, we can capture that as well. So Thomas says, less is sometimes more. Absolutely. And Heather says, use fully discrete, but not overly discrete scenarios. <laughs> Harry learned uh, about the US alcohol tax rules, which is good. <laughs> Keep them happy. I have found that that's uh, surprising when I talk in Europe and they say, well, you know, why wouldn't they pay for your wine? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Stunk and White, I think the, the names run away, but uh, admit needless words, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it very much is about communicating to people and making the, that communication clear, which is hard. Super hard, right? I mean, do you tend to see people when you go and coach people that people kind of over-describe or underdescribe as their kind of natural thing, or does it very much depend? I, I see both, and sometimes I see both at the same time. Right. Uh, one of the things about, you know, uh, uh, generalizing the details a bit, when I went from glass of wine to, to alcohol, um, one of the things I see sometimes is people generalize too much, and they're using the same terminology in the, um, you know, in, in their scenario that they used in their acceptance criteria. And, but that terminology is not clear enough. And so um, I had a case once where they were talking about a pre-fill value for uh, the customer's um, uh, job title and then uh, form value. And right. people were getting mixed up about you know, which was which, and that pre-fill value was especially a confusing term. Um, and so as they were explaining it to each other, then they said, well, you know, say they come in and they, you know, they've previously told us they're a musician, but they come in today and they fill out the form and say they're a music teacher. Then when we get to this screen, it should say music teacher. And everybody understood that. Yeah. And then they went back to their other, other way of talking about you know the pre-fill value and the form value and i said wait a minute wait a minute you, you know think about how you just cleared that up in your conversation use that in your scenario for sure yeah we've we've had other comments come through um someone saying that writing examples is it's hard in the same way that thinking precisely about what matters and what is what doesn't is hard. It's hard, um, but there's several things that make it easier. One, you don't have to get it right at the very beginning. We've seen how we can make it better. And two, there is no exact right answer. So, you know, it, you make it clear enough for now, and you can test this. You can take it back to the business people and say, is this what you meant? 
And you can take it to other people who weren't in the conversation and say, what does this mean to you? So you can test these things. Um, and there is no perfect answer, so you don't have to feel bad about where you are. Yeah. And I guess having those conversations earlier on is a much safer way of doing, doing things in general to kind of, rather than doing it later down the line, right? Oh yeah, I, I hate spending two days programming something and find out I misunderstood it. Yeah, that could be very expensive. <laughs> okay, um, and what, how, how can people get in touch with you, George? What's the, what's the best way? Okay, um, well, I put it on the first slide. I forgot to put it on the last one. So I'm at G Dinwiddie on Twitter. Um, that's probably the, the uh, most frequent way of getting in touch with me. Uh, you can also get in touch with me by email um, at uh, george at cucumber.io. That'll get to me. Yeah. So two simple ways of reaching out to me. That's great. Um, I have also just posted like a super quick survey. I think it's three or four questions. So if you could go to that, I'll be very happy. Um, tomorrow, I will send through the video. Hopefully, I can grab those slides from you as well, George, so that we can send that through. Um, okay. But yeah, please reach out to George on Twitter, on email, however you will. Um, yeah. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, it's a little strange not being able to see all your faces in the audience, but mm -hmm. I'm imagining you being there. <laughs> nice one. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.